Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is God's word to us today. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I've uh, titled my talk this morning, Being a Christian is the Best. A uh, very academic kind of title for you there. I wonder what is the best for you? What is the thing that is most valuable, most precious to you? Uh, as you know, the song says, you know, the best things in life are free. I wonder what would be on your list. I think we could come up with a pretty good list of the best things in life. Um, I find them uh, kind of a hard thing to do, though. Uh, I think because I always find the questions hard because I wonder, am I giving answers? The, are the answers I'm giving kind of the things that I think I should answer? Or are they the things that I actually believe? Um, at the Queen's coronation on the 2nd of June, 1953, she was presented with a Bible, probably slightly larger than this one, um, but the same Bible. Uh, and it was described as the most valuable thing that this world affords. Uh, kids are very good at letting you know what they think is most valuable and most precious to them in any given moment, especially if you're a parent. There doesn't seem to be any filter there. Uh, so if a child wants something, you know all about it. <coughs> a few years ago, our children really wanted a dog. Really, really, really wanted a dog. And anyone who knew our children knew that they wanted a dog. Requests were issued, pictures were drawn, tears were shed, letters were written. Literally, letters were written. I'm not... Bargains were offered, promises were made. They made very plain their heart's desires. And we caved. And we got a dog. Uh, they got their way. Um, how could you deny that face? You know. Um, in our passage today, uh, having thanked God for uh, his work in the Colossians, Paul starts his letter off with the prayer, uh, this prayer that we have. Now, uh, if you are someone who reads the Bible regularly, that won't surprise you. You kind of might just go along with that, but you won't kind of stand out to you at all. Uh, this is a long prayer. Um, in the original, it's actually one sentence that goes from verse 9, where we start, all the way through, through to verse 20. Just one long sentence. Terrible grammar. Don't do that. But Paul does, uh, and helpfully our translators have kind of broken it up a little bit for us so we can get it in our heads and understand it. Um, we're only looking at this first half of his prayer. And it's clear that Paul prays a lot. Uh, Paul is very prayerful, and he prays for the Colossian people, even though he's never met them. Uh, maybe you're a praying person too. Uh, I wonder if you tell people what you're praying for them. Uh, I wonder why Paul decides to tell the Colossians what he's praying for them. Why is that kind of the first thing that he wants to say to them? Here's what I'm praying for you. Is he trying to impress them with his prayerfulness? With how holy I am, I'm praying all the time? No, I don't think so. Uh, he's not trying to do that. No, what he is trying to do, I think, is teach the Colossians. And so teach us as well. Jesus said, the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. As a child goes to their parents and lays before them the desires of their heart, so when we pray to our Heavenly Father, 
our hearts are laid bare before God. And so if you're a praying person, then I think your prayers are a pretty good indication of your heart's desires. Uh, I think Paul tells the Colossians what he's praying for them because he wants them to know what really matters, what's really valuable, what's really precious. And so if you're a Christian here today, uh, there are things that you should consider to be the best things in life. Uh, these are the things that are worth devoting your life to. Uh, of course, there are no end to the things that you could devote your life to, but these are the ones that are worth it. There is no end to the choices. Uh, it's kind of paralyzing, actually, how many choices there are as to what you could give your life to, but Paul shows us the way here, and he says, this, these things are the best. This is what it's about. And he wants us to know why they're the best as well. So here's my outline, the best outline. Uh, it is, uh, first we're going to look at what a Christian knows is the best, uh, how a Christian can live is the best, how a Christian can cope is the best, and then finally, try to wrap it all up, what makes it all the best. So firstly, uh, what a Christian knows is the best. Paul says, uh, the greatest thing in life, the best thing in life, is to know God and His will. It's to know God and His will. Now, you see there in verses 9 and 10, he says, uh, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that Spirit gives so you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Right? For the Apostle Paul, this is what heads the list, knowing God and His will. This is the best life. If you want to live the best life, a life worthy of the Lord Jesus, if you want to please Him, then the thing that you absolutely must have, the thing you need above everything else, is a knowledge of His will. You can't truly really please God, of course, without a knowledge of His will. So knowing God is the greatest calling anyone can ever have. Because of who God is, there is no better thing in life than to know Him. But what does it mean to know God? And, and why is it the best? Um, as you'll no doubt be aware, uh, the Queen died this week. Uh, as I've uh, listened to you know, people on the radio and read comments, uh, one of the things that stands out, uh, to me at least, is that there were very few people who actually knew her will, like kind of her personal perspective on things. She really didn't reveal very much at all to anyone, maybe apart from those who were very close to her. Uh, the closest she got to her kind of revealing her personal thoughts was her Christmas message that she gives at the end of each year. Otherwise, she was very closed off. Very few people had personal knowledge of her will. Maybe in broad, vague terms, but not specifically. She was... I think this is true, the, the most, most famous, famous person, person in, the in the world, alive, 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 alive. 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 And, only and only a handful, handful of people really, really knew really what, what she thought about things. About things. But imagine, imagine this, imagine, imagine, imagine that, the that the Queen somehow, somehow crossed paths, paths with, you, with you and took and a liking to you, to you and kind and of struck up a friendship, I know that's like, Impossible. Right, but right, just imagine, imagine, just imagine, just imagine it. Somehow, somehow, somehow it happened in some kind of situation. situation. Uh, uh, you become, you become friends, friends with, the with the Queen, and Her, and her Majesty, majesty the Queen, wants to share, share with you what is what is troubling her, what she's what looking, she's looking forward, forward to, what her plans, her plans are. are. Just imagine, just imagine that situation. Kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. It'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. How would you, how would you feel about, about that? that? I think, I think you'd, you'd feel pretty special. Pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> the most famous <laughs> person in the world wants to open up, open up to you. To you. That's, that's, that's pretty special. special. Now, if that, now, if that is true of the Queen of England, of England how, much how much more, more is that true of the King of, of all creation? 
How much, how much more thrilling to know the almighty, sovereign, infinite God and his will. It's no wonder that uh, God says through the prophet Jeremiah, but the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me. The God of heaven and earth, before whom the nations are a drop in the bucket, comes to you and me and he speaks to you and he speaks to me and he reveals his heart to us. He tells us his plans, his joys, his griefs. He opens up in the scriptures and he tells you his will for you. And he invites you, sinful as you are, broken as you are, to come and work alongside him as his friend. It's pretty special. It's the best to know God and his will. Now, that's actually quite a countercultural thing to say. See, what does our culture say is the best thing to know? I think our culture would say the best thing to know is your will, my will, to know thyself. That's what it's about, to know what you want and go for it. This is a message that gets drummed into us and drummed into our kids all the time, right? Look inward. Uh, you can do anything. You can be anything. Whatever your heart desires, you have limitless options. Just find out what you want, who you want to be, and you can do it. I think it's no wonder that we live in such a confused and conflicted time when that is the message that's been drummed into us. The Bible says, far more than knowing my will, I need to know God's will. That's what can give me what I really need. And this is the thing that is more important than anything else. More important, the thing that we need more than anything else, it's to know God through his son, Jesus. It's the best thing in life. It really is. Everything else is just details. Now, I wonder, do you believe that? Or as C.S. Lewis says, are we half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us? Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. He says, we are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. And here's why. It's because in knowing God and his will... We actually have the ability to please God. Right there, there is a purpose, a purpose to knowing God and His will. See verse 10 there, it says, So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Now, just let that sink in a minute. You and I have the God given capacity, the opportunity to please the everlasting God. That we can give that gift to God to please Him. Now, just think about that. Think about the joy that comes from pleasing someone you love. That's a great thing to do, isn't it? To please someone when you know you've chosen something that is just particularly appropriate gift for them, or you've done something like sacrificial for someone you love, and they notice it. Right? Think about the joy that comes from that. It's very special. And we have the ability to please the heart of God by what we do, by how we live. By living in obedience to his word and honouring him in our lives, we can please God. If you are ever tempted to think that your life isn't that worthwhile, isn't that important, doesn't matter that much, like you can't make much of a difference. Gee, I've just got to tell yourself, that's rubbish. <laughs> you can please God. You can do that. You can bring joy to the God who created the universe. That is something worth giving your life to. That gives meaning, purpose to your life, no matter how small you feel. Uh, it's the best thing you can do in life. Now, when you know that, when that captures your heart, then it, it does, it changes the way you live. 
Uh, knowing God truly lives to a lifestyle of pleasing God. And it's the best life. Uh, which is our second point. How a Christian ca- can live is the best. So verse 10 says, So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. Uh, so how do we do it? How do we live a life wo- uh, walking worthy of the Lord? That, that sounds incredibly hard, doesn't it? Walk worthy of the Lord? How do you do that? Well, Paul says, uh, bearing fruit in every good work. And here he's reminding us that being a Christian, following Jesus, isn't just about what you think uh, or even just what you say. It's, it's not less than that, but it's more than that. Uh, right thinking leads to right living. And the Christian life is about what you do, how you listen, how you speak, how you behave. And as we do this, Paul says the truth of the gospel is bearing fruit in the whole world. But notice the way this works. As, as we live in the light of the knowledge of God, that is, honouring Him, walking worthy, we grow in that knowledge. Right? I'll say that again. As we live in the light of the knowledge of God, we grow in that knowledge. How do you grow in the knowledge of God? Well, by living in the knowledge of God, by, by living out God's will. That's how you grow to know Him more. Uh, how a Christian can live is the best. Uh, and that takes us to our third point, and that is that how a Christian can cope is the best. So verse 11, uh, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you may have en- great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks. Uh, Paul says there in verse 11 that it is a powerful thing to be a Christian. It's a powerful thing, but not power as the world would not, not power to lift yourself up and put others down, and certainly not the power to kind of make your life comfortable and easy and avoid heartache and avoid troubles. It's not that power. But what happens when we are filled with the knowledge of God's will? So it it makes all the difference to those heartaches and to those troubles. It makes a huge difference to know that whatever trouble you have in life actually has a place in God's will. It's not surprising to him. It's not, it's not chaos. God is at work in your suffering, even through your suffering. It has a place in his plan. See, knowing God's will in the midst of the trials that you face is the most powerful coping mechanism there is. This is how the power of God works in our lives. It's it's not as if the power of God is to, to remove the suffering. Sometimes he does. But that's not kind of where you see the power most, most evident. It's that he takes us through the suffering. He sustains us. He keeps us going. Don Carson says of this uh, spiritual endurance, he says, it is the kind of stamina that knows how to possess its soul in patience. I'll say that again. It's the kind of stamina that knows how to possess its soul in patience. It enables the believer to survive with joy when persecuted, to triumph in self-composure when insulted, to trust God's all-wise and all-gracious providence when one is suffering like Job. See, Paul says you can endure the darkest times and you can do it with joy, joyfully giving thanks. Not as if those dark times are fine. They still hurt, right? But you can still find joy. 
says there, verse 12, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the, in the saints' inheritance in the light. So if you're filled with the knowledge of God's will, then you're able to patiently endure with joy because you know you have an inheritance kept in heaven for you. That is your hope, your assurance. When my mum was uh, nursing my dad through the last six months of his life, uh, she had a verse that stayed with her that was kind of, I don't know, she would sing it uh, in a way to herself. Uh, it was Nehemiah 8.10. Sounds a bit obscure. It says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength that is in the midst of grief knowing the lord knowing that he is sovereign knowing that he loves you and cares for you and is right there carrying you through that gives you strength like nothing else can A and i saw it very clearly in my mum. she found joy in spite of that awful circumstance. We have the best coping me mechanism there is. Uh, fourthly and finally, what binds this all together? Right? What, what makes it the best? Uh, Paul finishes this uh, little part of his prayer with this wonderful reminder of what God has done. Uh, for Paul, Christians overflow with joy and thanksgiving. Uh, it, it's not just about the lifestyle or, or, or the change of mind. Uh, it's a change of heart. It runs deep. So that we have a, a joyfully thanksgiving heart. You're constantly giving thanks to God. How? Well, because, verse 13, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, if the thing that enables us to lead a life worthy of the Lord is a knowledge of His will, right? That's the thing, knowledge of His will. That's what enables us to... If, what is the greatest moment and revelation of God's will in history? not the Ten Commandments. It's not even the Exodus. It is the Gospel. It's the cross. It's the resurrection. It's, it's knowing God the Son through His life, death and resurrection. You see, in the Gospel we find that God has already made you worthy. How do you walk, live a life worthy of the Lord? Well, God has already made you worthy through the gospel so that you might walk worthy of the Lord. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, he lived a life we couldn't live. He was worthy. He walked worthy and he died worthy so that in him, you and I are worthy too. You see there verse 13, he has rescued us, past tense, from the domain of darkness and transferred us, again, past tense, this is done, into the kingdom of the Son He loves. And then present tense here, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in Him. Uh, here in these verses, Paul's using Old Testament uh, ideas um, that find their fulfillment in Jesus. right? Because Israel uh, was in the domain of darkness under the tyranny of the Pharaoh in Egypt, in slavery, they were brought out of that domain of darkness and into the kingdom of the son he loves, the, the lowercase son who is David, right? They were transferred from that, king, from that domain into this wonderful kingdom, God's kingdom. God's people were redeemed from slavery bought back by God. And that Old Testament story finds its true fulfilment in Jesus. 
not just bought out of the tyranny of a human ruler, but from bought out of the tyranny of our own sin and guilt and its punishment death. Because of what Jesus has done for you, by faith in him, you're worthy. And so we live on the basis of who and what we already are in Christ. Right? You were a slave, he says. That's who you were, living under the threat of death and punishment. But if you get rescued from that life, it makes no sense to go back to it. We now live in the, in the, this, in the kingdom of the son he loves, the kingdom of light. How can a slave go back to living under tyranny of the one who dooms him to punishment? No, we don't do that. We live as those who are worthy, who have been made worthy. And when you dwell in the knowledge of who he is and what he's done for you, well, it does, it changes your life. See, we can now live the best life, doing the good works in response to the good work with a capital G and a capital W, the good work that has been done for us. We don't do good works so that they'll make us worthy. We already have been made worthy. We have the best way to cope and endure, no matter what suffering comes our way, because he, the Lord Jesus, endured with patience his suffering and death on the cross for us. And so you know he will strengthen you by his spirit so that you're able to endure with patience whatever he gets thrown at you, knowing there is a great reward for you kept in heaven because Jesus is raised from the dead. Right, you see how the gospel works this through and brings it all together. It changes our hearts so that we are thankful. Right, because you know him, any response apart from humble, joyful thanksgiving is just utterly crazy. <laughs> God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The songs tell us the best things in life are free. I want to say I think that's kind of partly true, but mostly false. Uh, It's partly true. Knowing God and His grace does come completely freely to you. It's a gift of free grace. And it's the best. It is the best. And yet, it is also the most costly gift there ever was. It was not free. It cost God nothing less than his precious son. This son who we'll hear about more about next week. There was no higher price that could possibly be paid and God paid it for you. And even though it comes to you freely, his grace, and you know his grace, sorry, even though it comes to you freely, it will actually cost you everything, is the other thing I need to to say there. That's why it's not true that the best things in life are free. It comes to you freely, but it will cost you everything. Jesus requires that if you are to follow him and know his grace, he asks you to give up everything for his sake. He wants all of you, because he wants to save all of you. He demands first place in your heart. He is the high king of heaven. There's no, how can he have anything less than that? He requires that you give your life to him because he gave his life for you. And only when you do give up your life, trying to control your life, trying to please your life and bend your life to your will, only then will you find that your life is fulfilled when you give up control when you bend not your life to your will but your knee to his will only then will you find your life so uh, friends I want to ask you how will this prayer of Paul's shape your prayer your prayers this week here he has the best things in life 
What are you going to be praying for yourself? What are you going to be praying for your brothers and sisters? I want to encourage you to let this prayer shape your prayer, both for yourself and for your brothers and sisters, that you might please him in everything because he is just so worth it. Uh, Let's pray and then we are going to sing together. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your incredible gift to us in the Lord Jesus. We owe you our all. And it's a joy to give you our all. For you have made us worthy in Jesus. You have, you have saved us completely. Not by what we have done, but by what he has done. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live this life that you have for us with hearts that overflow with thanksgiving because you have done all that's necessary. And so we can cope and we can live joyfully giving thanks. Amen.